tell Richard Plum and anybody else he may be related to that we want to save the, that we want to save the people's post office. Yeah. 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 Because these post offices have been paid for taxes of our parents and our grandparents and our great grandparents. They're part of our historic legacy, going back to the Constitution. No posters, no 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 to tell you a little story that's very personal to me. And that is that in 1990, when I was working on my dissertation, I was back in Washington, D.C., and I went up to the Library of Congress. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. I was at the Library of Congress in 1990, and I went up to the Photographic Division. And if you go there, there are all these filing cabinets with some of the greatest photographs, documentary photographs ever taken. They were taken for the Farm Securities Administration during the 1930s. Um, and they were taken by some of the best photographers of all time, in particularly a Berkeley woman named Dorothea Lang. And she lived on Euclid Street, and her husband was a friend of mine. And um, so I was looking at these magnificent photographs that she took during the Depression and of the Japanese internment um, that are just, will bring you to tears. And I um, went to the librarian, and I said, I'd like to just make some slides of these because I'm a teacher and I'd like to show these. I won't reproduce them in any way. And I've never forgotten what she said. Her voice boomed out and she said, of course you can take pictures of those. Your parents paid for them. They're in the public domain. They're in the public domain. They belong to you. Now, I've never forgotten that. Um, because, and I guess that's why I've gotten involved in the post office, because back around 1994, I went into the Oroville post office and tried to take a photograph of a New Deal work of art there, and the postmaster said, you can't do that. I said, of course I can, it belongs to me, my parents paid for it. And uh, he said, no, we own it. And I said, does that mean you can sell it? And he said, I'm not sure. Um, but ever since then, I've been stopped several times, and then last week I was in Philadelphia, and I walked across Market Street, they have one too, um, to the, if you know Philadelphia, it's got two gigantic New Deal post offices. This one fills a huge city block. I went into the post office, the main post office of Philadelphia, and the guard stopped me, and he said, you can't go in there. I said, why? It's got, I could see this beautiful Art Deco lobby that my parents paid for. And he said, because it's not private. This isn't the post office anymore. It's been sold. It's now private. And I said, uh, but it belongs to us. And he said, no, it doesn't. And he said, if you try to take a photograph, you will be swarmed and your camera will be confiscated. Ooh. He then said, you can take a picture of the outside of it, which is more than one of my friends heard when she was in Catonsville, Maryland, and tried to take a photograph, not only of a mural, but the outside of a building. They said, you can't do that. It belongs to us, and you don't have the rights. Oh. This is what's happening all around the country. They're taking our buildings, our property, and even our art. The great art that was created during the 1930s, which is unique to the United States, it's in our post offices, it's up for sale in a package deal with these buildings. It's happening in Palm Beach, Venice, California, just about everywhere you can mention. These artworks are going on the market along with the buildings, and they belong to us. And so, thank you very, you know, they belong one of the, to us. They belong, they belong to, to us. us. They, they belong, belong to us. us. They belong to us. They belong to us. Okay. They belong to us. Um, and one they last thing. I must say that the, the press has been shamefully negligent yeah. in not covering this issue. Yeah, here, here, here. 3,700 post offices around the country are slated to be sold, and that's only the beginning because, of course, they're the goal of the U.S. Post Office Board of Governors and Postmaster General Donahue and the members of Congress is to make sure that this country in about five to ten years has no public postal service. Mm -hmm. And the, the press has not been covering it has not been covering the real estate angle in which Regent Baum and his lovely wife are so intimately involved. This is the first time that their names have been linked. 
with what is going on and what is being taken from us. So always remember, it's the public domain. Your parents and grandparents paid for it. It belongs to you. Don't let them take it away from you because the next step will be our national parks and everything else that's in the public domain. They have their eyes set on it. Richard Blum, you should feel shame. We're trying to tell the Berkeley Bay. I'm uh, pleased to be marching shoulder to shoulder with all of you in this just cause. First of all, I want to say to you that I was born in this city almost 68 years ago. And the woman who gave birth to me died yesterday oh. in Greensboro, North Carolina, where I live. But I want you to know that she would want me to be here. Yes. Because she was one of the fiercest fighters for justice that I have ever had the privilege to know. And her, that's right. And her name was Sarah Koritz. And when I was born here, my father was the acting secretary of the CIO Council of San Francisco. Oh, right at the, the end of the war, uh, World War II. But anyway, that's my personal statement. But the reason to be here is that right now Wall Street is running everything in this country. And I was saying to my Occupy friends uh, earlier, uh, we were saying to each other that it's great to have Blum as a target because when you have Blum as a target, you have Feinstein as a target. And when you have Blum and Feinstein as a target, then the mystery of the separation between <laughs> politics and economics disappears. Yes. All right. And so the, right the idea is what's driving this postal privatization, I love Ying's comments, what, what's driving this postal privatization is private profit. Yep. Yep. On October 5th, 2011, there was a an article in the Wall Street Journal in, on the editorial page written by a 34-year board of directors of the United Parcel Service. And he, more openly than any other person, an article that I've seen in this whole period, laid out how everything should be sold off in the post office. Everything, the trucks, the buildings, not just the historic buildings, the, the land, you name it, wipe it out. And the, the purpose of destroying the people's post office? Me. The purpose he laid out, you can sum it up in one word, but I'm going to say another <laughs> couple of words. Um, was to provide a bright investment opportunity in an otherwise dismal investment climate. So the people be damned. The people's post office be damned. They want to do it to education, public education. They want to pillage Social Security, Medicare. This is part of that struggle. And the last thing I want to say about this is that this people's postal service is not at all a drain on the Treasury, not at all a drain on the Treasury of the United States that's already so bankrupt. However, by the 2006 law that bleeds the post office of about five, five and a half billion dollars a year, which is the reason for the immediate crisis, they are able to try to, by stealing that money, they are able to try to cover some of these massive, unprecedented, historic uh, losses that have led to the bankruptcy of the United States. So when we're out here together, I, I'm, I'm pleased to be here with each and every one of you. We are in a noble fight to defend not just our own individual interests, but to defend the public interest against these Wall Street privatizers who have no shame and the stooges in the Democratic and Republican parties yeah. who do their bidding. I want to say that I'm not just a Berkeley City Council person, but I'm the vice mayor. And while the mayor is away, which is right now, I am the mayor. <laughs> and so let me speak on behalf of the people of the city of Berkeley to Mr. Blum and Senator Feinstein to say that we are united 
against closing our post office, not just for us, our historic legacy that was paid for by generations and built, might I add, with a great deal of love and care. Yes. But it's on behalf of all of the post offices yeah. and public facilities that, as this eloquent speaker who preceded me said, are being milked by greed. greed. So I just want to go on record, Mr. Blum, to say that the city of Berkeley, one of your wife's constituent cities, is totally opposed to your working on closing the post office. Yay! 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 Sending that message loud and clear and hope to deliver the same. To Good morning. It's great everybody is here. Okay. Uh, this is incredible. You know, I, I was just visiting my sons in Europe and I came back uh, really impressed because in Europe they have very active, dynamic post offices. I was in Italy and Switzerland. Um, and they're used by the people and they have creative ways of, of um, marketing things and to maintain their post office. They have postal banks, Italy and Switzerland. So um, I, I saw very clearly what dynamic, active post offices can look like. And I come back here and I see our post offices is pretty depressing, okay? And, and it seems very purposeful, this dismantling of not only the services, uh, taking away the jobs, but this public legacy that sp uh, speakers spoke of earlier. You know, this is all um, comes from tax money and our families have paid for this over generations. So why is it being taken away before our very eyes? And, and so some people say it's very complicated. You know, it's about the internet. Well, no, we know that's not true. Um, it, it's about the decline, decline in, in uh, the use of the postal system. Well, you just have to go to a post office and see the lines to know that that's not really true, you know? So essentially, it's about theft of, of the comments theft of the public sector. And, and so behind me, or to my right here, is a table from UC Berkeley. And many of us um, have connections to the university. We see the same thing happening there. And I know we'll have a speaker, so I don't want to go into that, but it, it's the same phenomenon. Okay, privatization of what was formerly ours. The one thing I will say, because I think so for the young people here, is that when I went to the university, it was essentially public. You know, um, you know, for a whole year, I paid less than a hundred dollars. Okay, now it's headline news that students, student debt is, is higher than credit card debt. So, where are we going with all this? So. We have, to, we have to protect our public institutions, whether it be the post office, whether it be the university, or anything that the American people, the American workers have created and paid for. So, I will end there, and I hope all, all of you join us as we march down to Diane Feinstein's office to let her know that, and, and she's come out in support of the post office, but we don't need a letter, we need leadership. Yeah. And we need Congress to step up. They created this situation, this artificial si situation of the post office going bankrupt. We need them to undo it. And that's the message that we need to, to give to her loud and clear, okay? That our post office is not for sale.
good information has gotten out here today, and it's hard to follow, but there is one point that hasn't been addressed. The Postal Service in the United States provides a half million good-paying jobs. You can support a family on it. You can, you can support my family on it. I'm a truck driver for the Postal Service. I'm also the director of organization for the American Postal Workers Union in Baltimore, Maryland. And I'm out here helping another union, and that's what solidarity is. But one thing that isn't happening, the leaderships of all the postal unions, there's four of them. There's the American Postal Workers Union, the National Association of Letter Carriers, the National Postal Mail Handlers Union, and the National Association of Rural Letter Carriers. Their leadership is relying solely on lobbying Congress. So what they're doing, in effect, is going to the puppets of Wall Street and asking those puppets of Wall Street to save them from the puppets of Wall Street. And that is a recipe for failure. So we just thought of this on the side. It would be a good thing, I think, because the unions have the financial resources and they have the bully pulpit if they would take it. For people to call those four unions and ask to speak to the presidents and ask that they take action in the streets instead of actions with their lobbyists. So what I have here today is I have the number for the headquarters of the American Postal Workers Union, if anybody wants to write it down. And you can look up the other ones online, very easy to find. So the number for the American Postal Workers Union, for anybody that has a pen, is area code 202-842-4200. Two zero two eight four two four two zero zero. Because the fact of the matter is, this fight for the United States Postal Service, which belongs to all of us, is going to be won in the street. It's going to be won by public pressure, not by lobbying, not by contributions. One of the postal unions even gave money to Daryl Issa in the last election cycle. That is insane. That that demonstrates cowardice, right? One of the unions gave concessions to the Postal Service, even though their official position to the public is that it's a phony financial crisis. That is a sign of weakness. That encouraged the enemies, our enemies. So everybody that's here is here because they are enlightened Americans. They know what's going on, and our job is to open the eyes and the minds of the other Americans that don't, that are not yet focused on this problem. Peter Byrne, investigative journalist. I've written three, two exposés on the Blum-Feinstein public-private partnership, and I'm working on a third one concerning the post office. But I would like to say that people may not understand that Richard Blum is what they call a vulture capitalist because he's a private equity capitalist, which is the polite term for vulture capitalist. Basically, he was an up-and-coming young stockbroker back in the 60s who had a bright idea. He decided that it would be a good idea to leverage billions of dollars in public funds, taxpayer funds, for, for private profit. So the first thing he did was to put a very uh, up-and-coming politician on the payroll. In fact, he married her right after Harvey Milk and, and George Moscone were assassinated. Diane Feinstein became the mayor of San Francisco and never looked back. She's done a lot in her career to advance her husband's agenda, which is her own financial agenda, since in California she shares everything that he makes. Now, I just want to tell you a little bit about what Blum and Feinstein have done in their partnership to uh, leverage public funds. One of the things they did was they helped to build the subway system in Los Angeles. 
which uh, was change ordered uh, up to about a billion dollars, which means that uh, instead of having to uh, be paid for the amount that they bid to do the job, uh, they declared that they had unforeseen circumstances, which is an old trick. Tom Bradley, the mayor of San Francisco of, of Los Angeles at the time, said that the Blum uh, and, and his partners were uh, change order artists. Anyway, they went on to do the same thing at San Francisco International Airport, the Richmond Bridge. Blum controls uh, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in CalPERS funds, public pension funds, teachers' uh, uh, funds in California. Um, and now he's got the contract to privatize uh, 3,000 post office buildings, a story which I'm working on and in which uh, there is much to reveal, so keep tuned. And the conflict of interest at the University of California, why don't you talk about what he did to the pension funds? He said he was going to help them out at the University of California? Well, Blum being a uh, vulture capitalist, the regents in their infinite wisdom decided he'd be the person that they should put in charge of the finances, which is more or less like putting a plate of raw hamburger in front of a feral cat. The predictable happened. Basically, uh, during Blum's tenure uh, in charge of the investment committee for the uh, UC Regents, one and a half billion dollars was sluiced into private equity ventures in which he had substantial stakes. The university invested in every single one of the companies owned by Blum Capital. And th the investments weren't very good. A lot of them tanked, especially the ones in real estate. Nonetheless, Blum and, and people like him, uh, Paul Walker, who's now the head of the committee, which uh, uh, who is also an investment banker, um, claim that they have a special expertise. Yes, they have an expertise. They're very expert at basically ripping off investors. And now they're ripping off like the, the entire people of California and it looks like uh, the United States, uh, which is just my opinion, of course, at this stage of things. And the Sherry Lansing, what role does she Sherry Lansing is now the president of the Regents, which is really quite remarkable since she has zero background in education and was appointed as a regent by one of these governors, I forget who. But as soon as she joined the uh, the investment committee, uh, she was appointed to the board of directors of Qualcomm uh, Corporation. And as soon as she was appointed to that board, the university bought some $400 million worth of Qualcomm stock, which greatly enhanced its value. Go figure. So you don't think she's operating in the best interest of the people and the students of California? I wrote a story, a tw uh, eight part series called In Investors Club about the Regents. It's just a big investors club. It has nothing to do with education. It has to do about leveraging public money for private profit and they've been doing it for 125 years. Do you think that Dianne Feinstein should be criminally investigated for steering contracts to her husband in the Iraqi war uh, contracting business? Well, I wrote an article which pointed out and proved that uh, the, com the subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee that she chaired uh, basically approved one and a half billion dollars of the contracts that went to her husband's companies. So I will leave that to the uh, uh, powers at, at the FBI and, and the uh, Judiciary Committee and people like that who I'm no doubt will be shocked. I believe that what is happening with our Postal Service, especially regarding the bulk sale of these properties, is not being done within the normal procedures, um, governmental procedures. The Post Office is claiming they're not a governmental entity. They're public properties. They were built with public funds and they should retain, be retained in the public portfolio. And I'm very passionate that we, are, that we continue um, our fight to keep our post offices open and part of the public domain. And our city council unanimously passed a resolution not only to keep open that Four Seasons Town Center post office, but to restore the hours of service to full service. Bravo. What's going on right now in the United States is that people like Richard Bloom, with the help of people like Diane Feinstein, even when they're not married legally, are illegally married by the relationship between corrupt Democratic and Republican Party politicians and Wall Street. Wall Street is trying to privatize the Postal Service just like it also wants to get its greedy hands on your Social Security. It wants to destroy public school education in the United States. It wants to uh, destroy Medicare and Medicaid. The fight for the public postal service is not only a fight for your right 
to have a universal postal service throughout the United States where you can mail a letter anywhere to anywhere else in the country at the same uniform rate and guarantee a secure delivery of that letter within a matter of days. Still a remarkable accomplishment. Yes. What will happen when they eliminate the Postal Service in order, uh, in order to reap private profit like Richard Bloom is reaping as the head of C.B. Richard Ellis, the largest real estate company in the United States, is selling off post offices, including the historic Berkeley Post Office that we're here to, to stand in defense of today. We're not just standing in defense of historic buildings. We're standing here in defense of your right to have a public postal service which doesn't cost anything in taxes. It costs only what you pay for stamps when you use this wonderful service that goes all the way back to the U.S. Constitution. So I want to appeal to you brothers and sisters that are walking by today to stand up, to wake up first of all, to wake up to the fact that Wall Street is trying to take everything from the public. It's trying to take, and if you're not a Wall Street one-tenth of one percenter, then you belong here with us in defense of public services of all kinds, in defense of the public postal service. So we look forward to you joining us in the days ahead as you realize that Wall Street right now, through the Democratic and Republican parties, is dictating to you and pillaging all your public assets in this country. We love you. We're here in support of you. We're here in support of ourselves. As a, as a representative of letter carriers in North Carolina, I want to say that we are proud that a half a million workers in this country still work for the Postal Service in a decent paying job. There aren't a hell of a lot of them left. So if you want to continue to fight for decent jobs, then we need to fight for those Postal Service jobs that are still union jobs, and we need to fight for the Postal Service to begin to hire more people into these decent jobs because one of the things that's happening is that the service is being eroded. They don't want you to ever fight for this post office. So they're eroding the service as we speak. And one of the main ways they're doing it is by not replacing retiring workers. The working class of, of the postal service is working harder than ever. And even though what you're being told is that the, the, the uh, business is getting to be less and less. Actually, with the advent of the internet, the parcel service business is booming. And the only current crisis is one that the corrupt Congress has, has created by taking five and a half billion dollars a year out of the Postal Service's treasury. The problem, the reason you haven't heard that is that the Postmaster General is a privatizer working on behalf of Wall Street. Please wake up, defend your interest, defend our public interest. In our unity lies our strength. Thank you. Oh, oh, well, look up there. This pernicious doctrine that came out of the White House in 1986. Some White House aide uh, said that our goal is to, this was during the Reagan years, uh, for those of you who are too young to remember, um, uh, our, our aim is to starve the beast, okay? That was the Republicans' idea that if you can cut taxes enough, you cut government off at the knees so that it cannot provide public services. And then you can justify anything like the privatization of post offices and national parks and virtually and the military and virtually everything because we don't have any money anymore. This is the wealthiest country in the world ostensibly, um, but uh, it's all going to a very small number. But if you don't have the revenue, you have to sell everything. And that's what's been going on. Remember last year they were going to start commercializing and selling California state parks because, what do you know, the Golden State is broke. It's bankrupt, and so we got to sell everything we have. And the same thing is happening with our post offices. Um, and the other thing is, of course, we have to fire our public workers because they're expensive. <laughs> Richard Blum, um, Regent Blum, built a... Um, 
built a, a, a building right next to mine on UC Berkeley. I've never seen anything like this happen. It went up very fast. Uh, a regent builds a private office building on the UC campus, named after himself. It's called the Blum Center for Developing Economies. And what the Blum Center does is study poverty in countries not this one. Places with people, people who have brown skin, you know, who we have to help. You can bet it will not study poverty in this country. Because even our president will not mention that there is gross, huge poverty in the United States, which people like Richard Blum and Senator Feinstein are taking it all. And so we have greater and greater wealth among a fewer number of people and greater and greater poverty because people who have living wage jobs can no longer afford it. One last experience I had last week, I was in Washington, D.C., and I took the metro out to Bethesda, Maryland. But, uh, we come up in downtown Bethesda, which was a charming village, I'm told, uh, and the only thing charming left about it is a beautiful stone New Deal post office with a mural on the inside of it. It's the only historic thing left in downtown Bethesda, which has gotten smart growth big time. So that all that's in Bethesda anymore is uh, high, really ugly high rises and shopping malls and this little post office. And the post office is in really bad shape because it was sold last year. Nobody quite knows to whom. And it's in terrible shape because the developer is not doing anything to maintain it. The door is standing ajar but chained, so the mural inside is molding. We own that. And um, it's quite clear that the reason for this is that that post office will be torn down and replaced with another high rise in what is obviously very valuable real estate, Bethesda, Maryland. This is what's in store for every inner city piece of, post, of, of postal property around the country. This is a 19th century corrupt land grab happening in the 21st century. In the 19th century, corporations like Southern Pacific and Central Pacific bribed our um, elected leaders to give them as much land as possible, but that was out in the boonies. Today, it's in the heart of our cities. The most valuable real estate, Santa Barbara, La Jolla, Venice, San Rafael, Burlingame, Palo Alto, Ukiah, and now Berkeley. But it's happening all across the country, and the media has ignored it so far. But we're going to make sure that they don't ignore it any longer, because we're noisy. Yes. And remember, once again, your parents paid for it. It's the public domain. We, own we it. all own it. We own it. We own it. We own it. Don't let them take it away from us, because we own it. I'm Valerie. I worked at the post office for a while years ago, and I'm an adult uh, returning to college uh, person. Uh, I've been taking some courses at City College, and the two issues are related, the privatization of the post office and the privatization of the educational system in this country. And that affects me personally, and it affects all of us personally, if we know about it. The Postal Service was uh, coerced by Congress to pre-fund, I, I forget the exact amount, $5.5 billion, I don't know if it's a year, to put the Postal Service money that the workers earn into a private, a separate account um, in order to hide the, the profits that the postal workers were making in the post office every year. To make it look like the postal service is going down financially, it is not. It's a, it's a, it's a scheme. And they're doing the same kind of scheming with the, with the privatization process of the colleges, uh, for instance, City College here in San Francisco. They're making a, a City College is a very necessary educational um, opportunity for many people that are, have very low levels of education and are, are, and are and don't have any money to have very little money to pay and they're trying uh, to clump a bunch of the classes and units of the curriculum together and it's the professors and the students are not for it from what I know from being on campus um, and and they're linking it also to the, the privatization of the educational system it's fine fine sign and blood they um well they're married and they um he is a regent in the University of California and um 
and he is also trying to buy the Berkeley Post Office, and his wife has something to do with that. My name is Ann Killebrew, and I represent AFT 2121 at City College. Um, we have a retiree group that are trying to participate in saving our democracy, and it, many, many aspects of our democracy are being whittled away, and today we're standing up for our post offices and our historic monuments. The fact that somebody can do the illegal um, act of saying they're going to buy all of our post offices, or at least the historic ones, is an atrocity, and we need to stand up and save our democracy.